Hi, I'm Lucy Lacanienta, a research assistant for the Book of Mormon Art Catalog, and I'm here today with Dr. Jason Combs. Jason R. Combs is an associate professor of ancient scripture at BYU. He holds a master's degree in biblical studies from Yale Divinity School and in classics from Columbia University. He earned his PhD in religious studies from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where he specialized in New Testament and early Christianity. Professor Combs has published a number of articles and books on the literary and cultural context of canonical and apocryphal gospels, as well as the textual transmission of the gospels. He is one of the authors and editors of the Maxwell Institute's award-winning book, Ancient Christians, An Introduction for Latter-day Saints, and his most recent project has been a book focused entirely on the sacrament. Thanks for being here with us today. Thank you. Our conversation today will come from 3rd Nephi's chapters 12 through 20, and the artwork that we'll be looking at today is here behind us. It's by Minerva Teichert, one of our most beloved and well-known artists from the catalog. It's entitled The Sacrament, and it was painted around 1950 in her typical style and medium of oil and masonite. To start us off, can you give us some context for this piece from the scriptures? Yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, this piece is often said to represent where Jesus introduces the sacrament in the Book of Mormon, so to the, the people in the Americas. In 3rd Nephi 18, it begins by, uh, by Jesus commanding his disciples to bring some bread and wine to him and he introduces to them this, this ordinance that has not been had among the Nephites before. And so as Jesus explains the importance of this ordinance and shows them how it is to be done, he uh, first blesses the bread and then the wine. And when he blesses the bread, he tells them in verse seven that they are to do this in remembrance of his body. And it's interesting here uh, in, in, the, in the old world, in the Bible, uh, it just says, do this in remembrance of my body, full stop. Uh, here in the Americas, it says, do this in remembrance of my body, which I have shown unto you. And I think that's significant because back in 3rd Nephi 11, the body that Jesus has shown unto them is the body, is his body with the marks of his crucifixion, with the marks of his atonement. Now, skipping forward to chapter 20, here we get a second administration of the sacrament. Now this time, Jesus does it miraculously in that um, the, the narrator makes it clear here that they did not have any bread or wine and yet Jesus suddenly starts blessing bread and wine that apparently just is manifest out of nowhere and he breaks it and blesses it, gives it to the disciples, they eat, then they administer it to the, the rest of the multitude. And here's where it gets interesting. It's at this point, if you skip down to verse 8 of chapter 20, that when they partake, uh, Jesus says that, that partaking of his, the bread that is uh, partaking of his body to their soul and drinking the wine is drinking his blood to their soul, and his soul shall never hunger and never thirst, but shall be filled. And in the very next verse, it says what they're filled with. It says, now when the multitude had all eaten and drunk, behold, they were filled with the Spirit. So now, after having introduced the Holy Spirit in chapter 19, and everyone had been baptized and received the Holy Spirit, now in verse 20, when the sacraments administered, they actually received the Spirit. Now, let me say something briefly about the miraculous nature of this administration of the sacrament. Uh, in the Book of Mormon, oftentimes the miracles Jesus performs when he appears to the Nephites as a resurrected being are heightened or magnified versions of the miracles he had performed in the Bible. And this is one of them. In the Bible, he miraculously multiplies loaves and fishes even though there weren't enough loaves and fishes to feed a multitude. But Jesus miraculously multiplies them in such a way that there is sufficient. Here, he miraculously multiplies bread and wine, even though there was no bread or wine to begin with. And actually, in the same collection of chapters we're focusing on, uh, 18 through 20, it explains the reason why Jesus does this in the Book of Mormon, where he doesn't do such uh, magnificent miracles in the Bible. In verse um, uh, 35 of chapter 19, it says, So great faith have I never seen among all the Jews, wherefore I could not show unto them so great miracles because of their unbelief. 
and then in verse 36, uh, Verily I say unto you, there is none among them who have seen so great things as ye have seen, neither have heard so great things of ye, as ye have heard. So the Book of Mormon offers its own explanation for why these miracles are even more miraculous uh, in the New World than the Old World. Um, one more thing to point out about the sacrament itself and why I think this miracle is so significant and why it's significant that this happens after Jesus' resurrection is that throughout the Bible and, and in texts that come after the Bible in, in what we call today the Apocrypha or Deuterocanonical texts, um, there are suggestions that the resurrection is tied to the end of times. These are, these are events that will occur uh, in the time that we would refer to as the second coming or, or the millennium. And there are other events that are also associated with the second coming or the millennium. In, in the book of Isaiah, one of those events is, is a, a large feast uh, that scholars have sometimes referred to as a messianic banquet. In Isaiah 25, 6, it says, uh, and in this prophesying of things that will happen in the future, uh, and in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast of fat things, a feast of wine on, on, on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, of wine on the lees well refined. Uh, so it's looking forward to this time where there will be this miraculous feast at the end of times. And Jesus actually alludes to this feast when he uh, introduces the sacrament uh, at the Last Supper in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, in the Gospel of Matthew, in Matthew 26, 29, after introducing the, uh, the wine portion of the sacrament, Jesus says, But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of the fruit of this vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And you can find a similar passage in Mark 14 or Luke 22. Uh, so Jesus, uh, in introducing the sacrament, directly connects the sacrament uh, a symbolic meal to this great feast that will happen at the end of time. Well, Jesus partially fulfills this in coming to the Nephites as a resurrected being. They are now experiencing, in a way, uh, a, a millennial kind of life uh, where Jesus is there healing all of them, gathering these multitudes, blessing them with the Spirit, and even miraculously introducing this feast of the sacrament with bread and wine. Thanks for that introduction to the scriptural context for the piece. Now let's move into the artwork itself. Can you walk us through how this artwork interprets the scriptures that it's based on? Sure. Um, a couple of things stand out to me right away. Uh, first, to give us a sense that this is occurring somewhere in the Americas, uh, there's some distinct Mesoamerican mm -hmm. sort of uh, patterns on the building behind Jesus, uh, on the cloth draped in front of uh, are over the table on which uh, Jesus is preparing the sacrament, um, as well as the figure in the bottom right corner over here. So that, that sets the stage for this being a scene from the Book of Mormon from somewhere in the Americas. Uh, a couple of other things stand out to me. One is the use of, of white and gold and yellow uh, to convey light emanating or radiating out from Jesus. Uh, so the brightest figure in the image is Jesus himself. Uh, then you also have a couple of Jesus' apostles on either side in white robes, but they are sort of positioned behind other figures in more colorful garb. And so this sort of gives this visual feel of the light of Jesus radiating outward. Uh, you get something similar on the floor uh, in front of Jesus, coming straight down from Jesus. There's sort of a, a shadow of light, of white and, and yellow coming down in that direction. And then also, uh, you may notice that the cup that is being held by one of the two disciples or one of the two apostles who's facing us is a bright white, uh, it has some white, yellow, or gold, as well as some of the bread uh, on the tray being held by the other disciple, suggesting that the sacrament itself is, is conveying Jesus's glory uh, to those partaking of it. So I, I really like that. How might we relate Christ's call to hunger and thirst after righteousness that we find in 3 Nephi 12, 6 to the ordinance of the sacrament? 
Good. I'm, I'm really glad you asked that. Um, a number of years ago, I actually presented a paper at the at the Sperry Symposium mm -hmm. here at BYU where I explored this a little bit. And this, this will definitely be a part of the book that I'm, I'm working on, on the sacrament. Well, let me start off by, by reading that passage as we find it in the Book of Mormon. Uh, in 3 Nephi chapter 12, verse 6, Jesus says to the Nephites, And blessed are all they who do hunger and thirst after righteousness, sh uh, for they shall be filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, this is interesting because it's similar to some of the sermons Jesus gives in the New Testament. Uh, we have a sermon in Luke chapter 6 that is often called the Sermon on the Plain uh, that is similar to this in some ways. Uh, but the third Nephi sermon is actually much closer to a sermon Jesus gives in the book of Matthew, in Matthew 5 through 7, called the Sermon on the Mount. Now, in Luke chapter 6, uh, the, the beatitude there is, Blessed are ye, are ye that hunger now, for ye shall be filled. And in Luke, there are corresponding woes that go with these blessings. So there's a woe unto you that are full in Luke 6.25, for ye shall hunger. Now in Matthew 5, it's not just hunger. In Matthew 5, it becomes blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. And it's left ambiguous what that filling refers to. What, what are they filled with? Are they filled with righteousness? Um, Perhaps to get at the answer to that, you first have to ask, well, what, what does it mean to be hunger and thirst after righteousness? So it may be that in the Book of Mormon context, we should be thinking, it in, of, thinking of it in these terms, in terms of hungering and thirsting to do God's will, hungering and thirsting to live righteous lives. And I think that is a really interesting description of, of an attitude or disposition to have. Uh, I think it's interesting because when you think of hungering and thirsting, those are involuntary actions, right? I, I don't choose to hunger or thirst. Uh, those are things that, that just happen when I haven't eaten or had anything to drink in a while. What does it mean exactly to hunger or thirst after righteousness? What does it mean to have a disposition that, that naturally or involuntarily desires to do the will of God? Uh, the first thing that comes to mind when I'm thinking about that is the response of the people in the Book of Mormon uh, back in the time of King Benjamin after listening to his discourse. Uh, it says in Mosiah 5 that they respond with this unified, unified voice and cry out saying, because of the spirit of the Lord omnipotent, which has wrought a mighty change in us or in our hearts, we have no more disposition to do evil, but to do good continually. The Holy Spirit had changed them in such a way that they now only desired to do good. And I think that is interesting because in this passage, as we have it in the Book of Mormon, the Book of Mormon Sermon at the Temple differs from the Sermon in Matthew in that the Sermon on the Temple explains what we're filled with. It says, Blessed are those who do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled with the Holy Ghost. And so putting that in conjunction with this sermon from, from King Benjamin, the people's response there, it sort of seems like you have to be filled with the Holy Ghost to hunger and thirst after righteousness. And yet those, who, according to 3rd Nephi, who hunger and thirst after righteousness are filled with the Holy Ghost. So it seems that in the Book of Mormon, there's this, this sort of cycle. And one can be filled with greater and greater degrees of the Spirit. So that it seems to work in such a way that that our feeble attempts to, to turn to God, to do God's will, which themselves are inspired or prompted by the Spirit, are then rewarded by a greater portion of the Spirit, which then in turn in, inspires uh, or, or creates within us this disposition that hungers and thirsts after righteousness. So what, what does this all have to do with the sacrament? Well, if you remember, uh, when Jesus administers a sacrament, at first it just says they're filled, and then after they are blessed with the gift of the Holy Spirit, and Jesus miraculously produces bread and wine and administers the sacrament the second time, it says that they are filled with the Holy Spirit, suggesting that that, that fulfillment there is directly connected with Jesus' promise in this beatitude at the beginning of 3 Nephi. So the sacrament itself both symbolizes and enacts this transformation of our dispositions 
to want to, to desire to, to hunger and thirst to do the will of God. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing your insights with us today. And thanks for joining us on this episode of Behold.